welcome everyone. We're going to get started. Thank you so much for coming to this talk by Skydance Animation. We're going to intro ourselves really soon, but we're just going to start it off. Um, kind of a little bit of rules, just save all your questions till the end. We will open for a Q&A, um, but just kind of let us get through the deck, tell you a little bit more about Skydance. We're going to have our lovely character, artists, and designers chat with you, and then we will make sure to leave room for a Q&A. All right. So, a little, if the video plays, up. talking more about that today, but we know that we are a new studio and a lot of people have questions just generally about what we've got going on here at Skydance Animation. So we're just gonna break it down a little bit about our future plans and how we work and then we're gonna jump straight into the panel. So to introduce ourselves, I'm gonna go first. My name is Anne Whitney and I'm the manager of talent acquisition over at Skydance Animation. I've been working in the animation industry for a number of years now. Um, I started in the entertainment industry at NBC Universal, doing their university recruiting over there. Um, and then I also moved over to their theme park recruitment, so that was really fun to work for Universal Studios Hollywood before I went into animation um, at Illumination Entertainment. They do the Despicable Me movies and Minions. Um, I've also interned at a number of places, including the Walt Disney Company and DreamWorks Animation. And my name is Ariel Goldberg. I am the Director of Talent Acquisition at Skydance Animation. I um, came to Skydance three years ago after having been at Nickelodeon Animation for nearly five years. Before that, I started in recruitment at Disney Interactive, and I worked as a character designer and concept artist in games and as a freelancer before that. Um, and so yeah, that's, uh, that's a very brief overview of my story. <laughs> Hi everyone, I'm Valley Pinhead. Um, can you <laughs> <laughs> uh, My name is Mali, I'm originally from Milan, uh, 2016 in the US. I went to school in Rochester and uh, I graduated during COVID and then I started freelancing and uh, I started uh, hi, I'm Chris Abels. Uh, I am the lead character designer on one of our projects at Skydance, and uh, I've worked for the studio since about roughly this time last year. Uh, and I've been doing character design and biz dev, I'd say close to 10 plus years now. Uh, I'm Natalia Fanchilia, and I uh, started my career at DreamWorks as a PA and moved into a production coordinator. And then I started at Skydance as a visual development artist um, in April. So, not to take the number one with the team, but yeah, I've been there since April. Yeah, and we're going to talk more about their careers later on. So, agenda for today, there's certain things about Skydance that we're going to be covering. It's going to be a little bit about Skydance in general, our core values, what we're all about, our upcoming slate, how our studio is structured, because it's a little bit different than usual, how to connect with us, and then we'll jump right into our main conversation. So, before I start talking about Skydance animation, I think it's really important to give you a little bit of Skydance history, because we do have other branches which hint, hint, our interactive team is, has been walking around if there's any people into gaming over here. But um, I have a little bit of notes because it's a long history to remember. But, so first, we started off with our parent company. It's called Skydance Media, and it was founded by our CEO, David Ellison. He had a very ambitious vision to establish a diversified media company to create high-quality content and engaging experiences for a global audience. The company's first feature film was True Grit. If you remember that one, it was directed by the Coen brothers. It went on to receive 10 Academy Award nominations, including Best Picture. Since then, Skydance has become a leading supplier of top-ranked films, including Mission Impossible, the Star Trek franchise, and Terminator. Most recently, we 
Freaks Top Gun Maverick. If anyone got to see that, yeah, we love it. <laughs> um, so that is our media branch. Then in 2013, the company launched its second pillar called Skydance Television, focused on, on premium series, bringing you shows like Grace and Frankie, my personal favorite, um, The Reacher, Foundation, and, uh, and Foundation, yeah. And then in 2015, Skydance continued its rapid expansion and the formation of Skydance Interactive. In 2020, uh, in 2020, the studio released The Walking Dead, Saints and Sinners um, to great acclaim to fans, and they're working on a, real, a bunch of really cool projects. Our two newest divisions are Skydance Media, which will shape the future of interactive media with story-focused, serialized experiences that put audiences in control of the narrative. Um, if you saw the recent announcement by Marvel, we're doing a Marvel game with them through that, that branch. Um, and then finally, we just launched Skydance Sports, a premier sports content studio producing scripted and unscripted content, such as documentaries and major events in the sporting world. And then finally, in 2017, David Ellison really realized that his lifelong passion by launching Skydance Animation, which we'll be talking about more about today. So we all feed into one company mission statement. So this is kind of overall for all the different types of Skydance branches. So our mission statement at Skydance is, we are storytellers who embrace visionary artists and innovative technology with the goal of creating premium level content for audiences around the world. We are passionate about fostering a culture that encourages creativity to help shape where entertainment is heading. And then spinning off of that, Skydance Animation has our very own mission statement. And our mission statement is, here at Skydance Animation, where imagination is being reimagined. We are a creative community dedicated to telling compelling stories for a global audience. We're using the power of animation to create memorable characters and explore immersive worlds across features, series, and shorts. We're dedicated to the creative process and the exceptional talent behind it. If we do this right, our stories will last forever. So who's leading the charge in this very ambitious mission statement? We have our president, Holly Edwards, and our head of animation, John Lasseter. They have extensive history, so I'm gonna try and summarize it as best I can. Holly Edwards is the president of animation, and a little history on Holly is Holly has been an animation veteran with more than 20 years of experience producing features and television. Prior to Skydance, Holly worked at DreamWorks Animation, where she worked on production and executive <coughs> roles, such as films on Kung Fu Panda, Trolls, and How to Train Your Dragon, just to name a few. We're super lucky to have her with us. And then finally, we have John Lasseter. Lasseter, um, previous to Skydance, John was the chief creative officer at the Walt Disney Company. Um, and Pixar Animation Studios, and the creative principal advisor to Walt Disney Imagineering. John made his directorial debut in 1995 with Toy Story, and it was the world's first feature-length uh, computer animated film. He also directed Bugs Life, Toy Story 2, Cars, Cars 2, and executive produced all the Pixar feature films since Monsters, Inc., up until his transition to Skydance. John also served as the executive producer at Walt, of Walt Disney Animation Studios, producing films such as Tangled, Wreck-It Ralph, Moana, Frozen, Big Hero 6, and Zootopia, just to name a few. So yeah, pretty experienced leadership leading the charge. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about our core values. Um, it all goes back to our mission statement. Our core values are really helping to set the foundation uh, for what we want our studio to be. And this is from our culture internally to our content that we are gonna be exhibiting to all of you. Um, first and foremost, we are a creative-driven studio, and this means that we are betting on people and we want to empower artists to tell their stories. We also believe in deep collaboration. Um, for instance, uh, we have studio screenings for all of our projects, once a project's been in production for about 10 months or so, it, we put it up on its feet in a very early incarnation, and we repeat this exercise every three to four months until the film is ready to be released. And the entire studio is involved in this sort of vetting process where we get to watch our movies, comment on them, leave feedback. It doesn't matter if you're a senior level executive, if you're an intern, if you're the janitor, everybody gets to participate 
and kind of contribute to the success of our moves. Um, our development team is also always interested in a great idea, wherever it may come from, um, and we uh, like to give our employees within the studio the chance to pitch ideas on a semi-regular basis. We've done it once so far, the pandemic hit, it set us back a little bit, now we're getting back into the groove of that. We also want all of our stories to have an emotional core. The emotional core, as it says up there, that's the clear why. Why does this story need to be told? Um, with our studio, with our stories, excuse me, we don't believe in pandering to an idea of what we think an audience can handle. With our films, we're going to be asking both the adults and the children in our audiences to stretch emotionally, intellectually. We like to lead into some deeper themes, deeper subjects uh, than maybe our sometimes uh, thought of as you know something that's geared for family entertainment. We're trying to elevate the art in that respect as well. Um, ultimately, at the end of the day, it's just important that our audiences have a good time. Message aside, um, we want to be boldly original. Um, uh, we are taking fresh swings on big ideas, and we want to be creating content uh, that is new that you haven't seen before. All of our IP so far, with one exception, uh, is original content. The one project that we're working on right now, that actually this crew here is working on, uh, is our first uh, series. It's also our first adaptation. But when we are adapting that previously existing IP, we look for things that are, in their own right, very, very original and bold. Um, impactful. Uh, we really want our stories to resonate with our audiences. Um, we believe that we have a social and cultural responsibility. We want to make sure that we are representing our audiences on the screen. We believe in deep research uh, and sparking a dialogue, right? Uh, the, the movies that we're telling, the stories that we're telling, they don't always have to be easy conversations. We want something that's getting people to think and when we are representing a particular, whether it's a particular profession, a particular era, a particular culture, we dive deep into research. We make sure that uh, behind the camera, so to speak, everything's behind the camera in animation, um, that uh, behind the camera, we have folks contributing to the storytelling that are of that profession, of that culture, maybe not of that time if we're talking about the 1800s, but, um, but we really believe in deep, deep research. Immersive worlds. Um, as you see up on the screen, this is a shot from our upcoming second feature film, Spellbound. We believe in using the power of animation to transport an audience. When we show that establishing shot of a new world, whether it's supposed to strike fear or whether it's supposed to be just beautiful, we want everyone to respond like, wow, I want to go there. I have to see that. And, um, and uh, it's, it's really, really important for us that you all believe that this world is a tangible place, that there are real characters inhabiting it. Um, it's, it's, a, it's really, really fun to, to build these out and to explore them. And who better to tell you about the studio than our own studio employees? So we're going to show you a short little video of them talking about their experience at Skydance. And fingers crossed that it actually works. <laughs> <laughs> I totally just wanted. <laughs> yeah, it's connected to the internet, so. Well, you guys can go up to work near creative people. And I did that in spades here at Skydance. Everyone here is just a. So yeah, we're going to skip it. You can watch that on our LinkedIn page. I totally just yeah. wanted to work near creative people. And I did that in spades here at Skydance. Everyone here. It's just so talented. Our people are funny and hilarious. They know what work-life balance is. Everybody here is really friendly, and we have this big kitchen with snack. Oh, we have a big oh, kitchen so with snack. <laughs> <laughs> That's the most important part is green food. Green food. Yeah. Um, as far as our, uh, oh, are you doing slide? I'm doing slate. As far as our slate goes, uh, we have a number of projects lined up. I think right now we have five uh, projects in various stages of development. Our first short film, Blush, uh, came out in the fall of 2021, about a year ago. Uh, we're very, very proud of it. It's a truly 
wonderful and very deep story, uh, and even that fits into six, seven minutes um, based on the, the true love story between the director and uh, his wife, uh, as translated through this sort of fantastical prism into a story about an astronaut and um, the, uh, the alien that, that he calls him uncle. Um, our, uh, this last summer we released our first feature film, Luck, on Apple TV+. Plus. We're all very, very proud of its success. It's been doing really well on that platform. Uh, we're very lucky to have had a partnership with Apple. Um, and, uh, and coming up, in, hopefully in uh, 2023, um, yeah, 2023, sorry, I'm stalling because I'm trying to <laughs> organize a thought here. Yes, in 2023, at the end of the year, our second film, Spelldown, uh, is scheduled to come out. Uh, this is a fantastical story about a young princess who has to rescue her accursed parents, as you see here on the screen. Um, and uh, it's a really, really wonderful story. It's uh, directed by Vicki Jensen, who was a co-director on Shrek. Uh, I'm not I'm giving her whole resume in like one credit. <laughs> she's, uh, she's got a lot going for her as far as her career. Um, so we're very, very excited. It's going to be a musical with music and lyrics by Alan Menken. Um, and then our first uh, series is also slated to come to premiere on Apple TV Plus in 2023. That's the project that these three are working on. Um, our third and fourth movies are uh, scheduled to be uh, released in 2024, and our fifth and sixth films in 2025. We are aspiring to get to a place where we are releasing two features per year. that on our LinkedIn and YouTube channels. <laughs> so our structure, like I mentioned before, we're set up a little bit differently. So in Los Angeles, that's where our pre-production pipeline is happening. So that's mainly focused in art and story, and it jumps to edit post. Our CG pipeline is taking place in Madrid, Spain. Um, so Madrid is kind of the larger entity where those CG roles are. So we're about 250 in Los Angeles and 700 in Madrid right now. We also have a very small entity that just opened called Skydance Animation East, which is basically the New York Tri-State Connecticut area. Um, and they also may, mainly focus on the CG roles and working closely with Madrid, Spain. So that's kind of our general structure. I will say there are exceptions to the rule. You might know some biz staff story artists that are in our Madrid offices, and you might know some CG artists that are in our LA offices. We want to work with exceptional talent, so we will try and work with the talent to work with them based on their location. Then this is the split of the role, so just kind of so you can see generally what we hire for in each location. So you can see again, Madrid is the majority of that pipeline because of the CG roles, but we also hire a lot in Los Angeles as well. Life at our studio, so we do have some perks. Um, we already mentioned the free snacks and the big kitchen. Uh, thanks, Brooklyn. She's tabling here if you guys want to stop by her booth. Um, <laughs> a plug for her solo merch. Um, so we're a global studio. What we really love is the globalness of our studio because what's so great about having people from all around the world work on our projects is there's different types of humor. It gives more creative process and it gives our films a different spin than having it all in one location. People are our priority here at Skydance. We focus on career growth, so we are not a project by project studio. If you um, enter Skydance as an artist, typically we're hiring you to roll project to project and retain you and help grow your career. Um, we're committed, committed to diversity inclusion. We have our creative inclusion team, which we already kind of talked about, our story trust. We have a creative inclusion trust that also just focuses on the diversity within our films. Um, we are a feedback culture and we love volunteering opportunities. We also are committed to certain nonprofits. Screenings, so we mentioned the screenings already, but we also have company events, screen spaces, and panel roundtable discussions, all by our events and culture team. And then finally, just kind of general benefits, so you know them. We have great benefits here being at Skydance, not just cool people, but we also believe in taking care of those people. We have well-being programs, training programs, 
language classes because we do with, work with Madrid. Madrid gets English classes and we get Spanish classes. So if you want to learn a little bit, but no, you do not have to speak Spanish to work in Madrid. Just have to buy it. And we will also help with relocation. I'm sorry, relocation assistance. And if you want to learn more about Skydance or are interested in our jobs, that's our job listings page. Um, you can also just find our website and go directly to animation and see what we're hiring for. However, we have a special expression of interest form just for light talks. If you scan this QR code with your phone, basically what we're doing is a portfolio and resume drop for the weekend. And about one to two weeks after light talks, the recruitment team is going to be reviewing the portfolios. And if they're, if you're, if one, it's guaranteeing a look at your portfolio, but also um, it, we are reviewing them and if we think you're a good fit for a job or if we think you have a lot of potential for the studio, we just want to get general notes, we'll be writing messages out to anyone that drops their portfolio in that bucket. And that will close on Monday. All right, the main event. <laughs> So the main event is really these three very talented people sitting to my right, and, um, and Whitney and I uh, have essentially done our part. We're now just going to be moderating the conversation between these three, so no pressure, you guys, but sounds smooth. Um, I'll kick off the first question. Um, I'd love to start with your personal stories. What, um, what was your, how did you get your first job? What was your start in the industry, and, and was networking a big component of that? Um, yeah, my my first job, honestly, I, I really can't remember too much about it because I'm older than I look. Um, <laughs> networking was something that I was always really against, personally, because you know I think a lot of artists probably relate to being introverted and kind of shy at times. And for me personally, there was this opposition to it because I felt like, oh, if I'm networking. People are going to think that I have an agenda and that I'm only talking to them because I want something and it feels disingenuous and it took me a really long time to accept the fact that you can do those things. You can talk to a complete stranger about your career and still be you know, kind, polite, and personable and, and you know, everybody in this city, you know, if they're working in the entertainment industry, knows that in a lot of ways this, this industry runs off who you know and how you are connected to them. So, uh, through a lot of trial and error too, and a lot of like psyching myself up to do something that I really did not want to do, um, I kind of learned to network. Uh, yeah. Uh, my story is a little bit different because uh, after I finished school and I won, I tried so hard, somehow get into the U.S. to work in the industry, and then I started school at Rochester, and I tried so hard to get a visa to be able to work. <laughs> Um, and then I almost get there and then COVID happened, but it was a good thing because everything went online and even I was in Rochester, I was able to like attend events, portfolio reviews as much as I could, so I was at home and that was all I did. And I got like so many freelance opportunities and uh, yeah, this is how I still with my skylines and yeah. Yeah, we met Molly, when I met her when I was at Illumination and she had actually Put her portfolio in for an event similar to this, and that's how we first met. Yeah, I think I met met both of you in the current studio. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I went at like all the portfolios that was possible. <coughs> and I met through Lightbox last year. Yeah, and I met Chris through Lightbox. My career started uh, probably a lot longer after I graduated, so it took me about ten years to get. And, like the foot in the door as a PA. Um, I graduated in 2011 and I got my first job right when the pandemic hit as a PA. So I was like, okay, that's, that's how it's gonna work. But before that, I worked in retail. And so you get a lot of experience talking to people. I worked in a theme park. I worked at Universal Studios. <laughs> in a, a wizarding world, I was a wizard for a while. And um, hundreds and hundreds of coming to you, talking to you every day. It really pushes you out of your comfort zone. So I think that helped a lot with like networking and kind of getting comfortable introducing myself, talking to people. So 
you have to kind of just use whatever skills if you're in retail right now just look at it as like a stepping stone to kind of help you with networking for sure it'll help a lot i think natalia's story is really great in that sense because i I mean, a lot of artists give a lot of portfolio reviews, and I tell people the start of your career is the biggest hurdle. It's the longest drag. And for some people, it takes a few months. For some people, they get it right out of school. For some people, it takes several years. And I mean, you're looking at her artwork right now. Like, there's no <laughs> question of her talent. But sometimes it just takes a while. And so, just, I, I'm a fan of saying the only people who don't make it are the ones who give up. Because if you're not giving up, then there's still hope. You know, so just keep going at it because 10 years is a long time. You could have given up, you, you know? It sure is, yeah. But you didn't, so that's awesome. Thank you. And I want to point out, look at how different each of their journeys were and their entry points. Um, that's what I love about these folks and how they represent just different avenues that they took, but still all through networking, because Natalia, we met you through Frank. <laughs> yeah. Um, a component of this conversation that, as we were putting it together, we thought was very important was to address what is, how do you fill that gap between what you learn in school, and I'm gonna to try to give some love to this side as well, uh, what you learn in school and what the industry is demanding of you, right? You, your skill set gets to a certain level with your education, but quite often you get out of school and you're going, oh, I'm not ready yet. So I would love to turn the question over to this panel what is the, uh, the industry standard, the standard of a studio like Skydance um, that you feel maybe is not yet, uh, not something that you see in a lot of portfolios coming straight out of school? What is it that people should be aspiring toward? One thing that I have noticed, uh, and this was also a mistake that I made early on in my career, was when I was in school, you know, everybody who loves to draw, who loves animation, probably has their fads and their trends and the characters from whatever games, movies, TV shows that they love, and oftentimes they will do a lot of what's called fan art. And fan art is great, it has its place. Um, I learned this lesson the hard way, and it wasn't until I actually had an art director at DreamWorks tell me, yeah, we're not going to recruit you based on fan art. It's, you know, it's great that you know how to draw, you know, fill up the blank, but we already know what that character looks like. We want to see what your original characters look like. And when I was in school, again, was a while back, um, there wasn't a lot of focus on really kind of creating your own characters. The focus was learning more of like the technical side of uh, animation, whether it's cool films, you know, you're doing design and you need to understand anatomy, or whether you were learning how to do 3D modeling. Um, there was very little emphasis on actually creating your own content. And I think schools have changed since then, um, since animation has become more successful and, and more widely you know, accessible by people throughout the world. They realize that they need to, you know, really kind of up the game a little bit, where students need to get out of school and be a bit more prepared. But I personally think that a lot of times um, people who are in school still kind of struggle to find, okay, well, I'm creating these characters, but I, maybe I'm not a writer, or maybe I'm not this, or maybe I'm not that, so I don't know how to create original characters. And the best thing that I can really say is if you find yourself in a situation where you can't think of an original character to create, draw from resources like literature or film and TV, but use um, options that are not widely seen. You know, everybody knows what the characters from Wizard of Oz looks like. Everybody knows what Harry Potter looks like. Everybody knows what these beloved characters are throughout film and TV. Pick more obscure characters that you've never seen, or characters that people have only read about but have no idea what they actually look like. Um, that's a great stepping stone, I think. Molly, when you were talking about this a few days ago, you had some interesting insight about um, kind of how to balance your personal voice versus making your style more flexible and kind of uh, higher level. Yeah, yeah, like, uh, so, like, it's out of this book that you need to start a basic, so you can have to know exactly what you want to do. And, like, even when you have to be more interactive designs, but you have to be working for them, but you also have to be like, flexible, like, 
knowing other different styles and character design and like also have your voice and kind of um, I would say like for the portfolio it's nice to have a little bit of your personal story or culture or background that's very helpful because it would attract And it's not like you know, like my princess is the fan or the, the TV company. And um, yeah, just show that you will be flexible. I think this is very important. Like don't do this one design or like one aspire for your whole tool. Yeah, they have few more stories, more than one, different design. Like, yeah. and, and Natalia, you were also talking about how important it is to like show the whole workflow, like not just yeah, so um, usually when I do like my portfolio, I'll, I didn't realize how much it's it's good to show like, uh, like character breakdown and like packaging because that's basically what you do most of the day. It's just you're putting together <laughs> packets and packets of information for people and you have to be aware of all people that are past through the pipeline because it's not just you. It's not your work and that's it. You have to think about, okay, this is going to a modeler, this is going to a texture artist. So you have to be very clear about all the stuff that you are giving them. And I think having that specificity in your portfolio is really good. Um, like I didn't know costume design was a thing for the longest time. And then someone like encouraged She's so good at it. You've seen some of her stuff up here. <laughs> so like someone encouraged me to start looking into that and it, it's like I finally was able to tailor my portfolio very specifically to costume design. And that's kind of like you have to find, it's great to know a little bit of everything, but having that like very specific, I want to be a costume designer, I want to be a character designer, and just go for it. Like just focus on that one thing and get really, really good at it. Can I prompt you guys a little bit more on the adapting your styles, especially on your current show? Because you each have such unique styles. Like how is that? Is there challenges? Do you find it easy? It's also very interesting because like I did a design for characters that I've already done with like so other character designers like done a little bit of it and then they hand it to me to like I'm other person completely has a different design and I have to like adapt their design for the show and like move the character forward. So it's like yeah. Yeah, as um as lead character designer, you know, part of the job is kind of overseeing the other designers in their work to make sure that, you know, whether they're drawing human characters or animals or, or alien creatures or whatever, that they all look cohesive as if they exist in the same story. So, and because everybody has different styles, adaptability really is key. Like you, you know, if you're so rigid with one particular style, you may not be a good fit on a particular project if they're going for something that's very, very different from your style. So learning to be flexible and learning to, uh, well, because ultimately, no matter what you do, it's going to be your style. It will be recognizable to you and to eventually your viewers. But yeah, you have to learn to kind of adapt, and kind of study your coworkers and what, what they're doing and how they, you know, the, the touches that they add to their characters and the things that they do to kind of make them their own while still working in the overall parameters of the look of that project. Yeah, and I would say like you can adapt any style if you know the fundamental design. If you know anatomy, if you know how to give the drawings, like all these fundamentals, it doesn't matter what your style you need to know as a designer. You can like be flexible pretty much. Natalia, you had talked about um, I'd love to go on to like how we uh, acquired the skills, right? Um, that that were needed, and you talked about finding mentors. Can you talk to that a little bit? Yeah. So when I got out of college, I again I, I knew a little bit of everything, but not really stuck to anything. Um, and so I was just looking around for online classes, and I happened to find a uh, really good mentorship with Chris Oakley of Oakley Academy. And he was my first art mentor and he uh, basically guided me into like the visual development side. He had a whole visual development course that he was doing. And so that's where I learned a lot of like 
painting skills from him. Um, and he was uh, an artist that worked at Disney as a painter, and um, he, he sort of showed me the level that it has to be at at Disney. So I was like, okay, I gotta hit this level just to even be hireable at this point. Um, and then while I was working with Chris, I actually met my costume design mentor, uh, Jessica Kate Bowie, and she uh, she was one of the first people who saw my portfolio and was like, have you ever thought about costume design? And I hadn't, and she offered her one-on-one -on -one mentorship, and from there, that's kind of like what helped me pivot into that direction also. So it's really just finding the right people who can see what you're good at, and really encourage you, like I keep in contact with both of them to this day. They still like anytime there's something that's going on, they'll reach out, they'll like, congratulate me on something. It's just like it's so good to have that connection with someone who's just like even if they're not your mentor anymore, they're still like encouraging you to help again. Thank you. I'm sorry just a second. Do you mind if I ask what's going on in the back? Because it's a little bit distracting. <laughs> I'm sorry, sir, does this have to happen during our talk? Sir? I'm sorry, we're giving a presentation. They call us to close the doors, but it's not, it's, it's crooked. So we can leave it like that if you want. Just, just so long as this isn't happening during the presentation, we'd really appreciate it. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. Sorry about that, everyone. Um, moving right along. Um, <laughs> um, let me just get back to my notes here. Um, Molly, how did you feel as far as like, or did you feel prepared for the industry out of school? Uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> Can we talk to that a little bit? Yeah. I also went to school called Rochester Institute of Technology. <laughs> <laughs> And I feel like in art in general, it's like that. You have to just find your way yourself or with a mentor. Like, I think going to school is very good because like people you meet and build your person like personality. Like, uh, and when you know which one and who are your friends, it's just like the talk you can have in the school and like the idea of it. Like all of these makes like I think these are the good parts about like going to school, not like being prepared for the house. Yeah. Uh, that feeling of being prepared, uh, I don't think it ever exists. I don't think you're never going to feel prepared. I mean, I've talked to people who have been doing this 20 years longer than I've been alive. And they're like, oh yeah, that, that feeling of being a dumb, young kid who doesn't know what they're doing. Just like in every other aspect of your life, it never quite goes away. You just kind of learn to fake it until you make it, so to speak. Um, and you do start to build more confidence in yourself and you start to become more sure, but then you move on to another project and it kind of starts all over again. So it's just kind of learning to, to handle that feeling. High school doesn't, I don't think it even exists anymore. <laughs> so, uh, you know, a lot of the contacts that I made with people around me, so not even like big professionals, it's like my friends are the ones that help, you know, show me like, hey, you should apply here, there's this job that's open up, or, you know, we're always helping each other out, so it's always good to like, just be around the people that are the same level as you right now, and like, everyone here is a peer with each other, and so it's, it's good to just make those connections at this level, because you never know who's going to help you get that next step, it might not be school, it might just be someone that you might hear in my thoughts, you never know. To kind of piggyback off that, and what I was saying earlier about the networking thing, um, I went to, to UT in Austin years ago, and that was back when their animation department was just called Studio Arts. And uh, when I wanted to be an animator as a kid growing up, until I checked out to school and saw that it took to be an animator and realized, yeah, I don't actually like the process of sitting in front of a computer and manipulating a frame by frame. And, uh, no offense to the animator. <laughs> I mean, honestly, more power to them. I mean, it takes a certain amount of patience and talent. And, but uh, because of that, and I kind of had this, you know, 
mini early midlife crisis, I was like, well, if this isn't what I want to do, what do I want to do? Uh, and actually ended up dropping out of art school and took a year off, and a year and a half later, ended up going to film school. So all of my connections are related to the film industry, which obviously overlaps, especially in this town, but I, I do look back at times and think, God, I wish I had been better at making connections and networking when I was at art school because some of those people I'm sure have gone on to do really, really great things and you know, I have no contact with them. So. What, in terms of coming out of school and being at the start of your careers, what are some uh, problems or setbacks that you observe young artists having that you'd like to sort of uh, tell them like, hey, I see this a lot, I think you should try to overcome this, get over this, um, if you really want to push your career to the next level. That's one more rejection. <laughs> Lots of rejections. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, and we all do it, but comparing yourself to other people's work, comparing yourself to other people who are years ahead of you in their career, and beating yourself up, expecting that you're supposed to be at the same level they are, when the reality is that they were in the exact same place that you're feeling right now, they were in school or just getting out of school. Uh, at any point in their past, they were going through a valid rejection or a you know, beating themselves up thinking that they weren't good. And so comparing yourself, I think, obviously is is dangerous because, I mean, we all do it, there's no stopping it, but if you really let it get out of control, it will ruin your imagination, your creativity, and your actual desire to even do this job. Um. I think I have like a really specific example of myself where well, for the longest time I wasn't getting callbacks, I wasn't getting anything, just years and years of nothing. And I eventually like was watching just a random TikTok or reel of recruiters, not in animation, and they're talking about resumes. And uh, it was like just do a basic resume. You don't have to make it like super fancy. Like it's cool to have like a fancy resume, but. They did like a test between a really fancy one and just a plain one, and a plain one, not lots of job callbacks. So I was like, you know what? I have a fancy resume. I'm going to just break it down into like the most basic looking word resume ever. And that's literally the resume that I sent to you guys. <laughs> to a bunch of places that uh, ended up starting getting like job callbacks. Spoiler alert, it worked out. <laughs> It's like readable and you know everything is correct and organized and just make it easier for the people who have to hire you uh, because they look through a lot of resumes. I'm, I'm like I can be mad yeah. <laughs> I look through a lot of stuff and so yeah I think that's like a big mistake is that we we try to put so much like personality and flash and everything into you know social media and all this stuff and sometimes it's okay to just have like take it back a little bit and just make sure you're, you're doing things the right way and, you know, being organized. We had more questions prepared to ask our panelists, but we have about 10 minutes left and we'd rather, we, we wanted you guys to go deep on the questions rather than go broad and just keep having good personal answers on everything. But we definitely want to leave these 10 minutes now for all of you to, to ask your questions. Um, I don't know if there's a specific way we want to do this. I'm coming around to my so oh, yeah. raise your hands. <laughs> hey guys, my name is Jeremy. I really get my phone. Um, <laughs> guys, how did you find well, Use it just because maybe there are people back there. Oh, okay. Hey there. <laughs> um, how did you find a PA uh, like position? And what are some things that you guys look for for future PAs? Which are not physical or position assistants. Yeah. Um, so the PA position I got was a friend of mine knew some people on the show and was like, let me let me give you your resume and we'll see what happens. Um, again, that's why I encourage you to make friends with each other and like really rely on each other for these kind of jobs because these are like the jobs that you get your foot in the door and these are the jobs that people like, start out with. So it's really about knowing people and helping each other get into these positions, for sure. Uh, hi, my name is Andrew. 
Um, so I was told, if I want to get a more careful example of his death, um, they told me, like, this is like very saturated and this is a cultural industry. If you want to like, go into this kind of industry, you have to stand out um, all the your In terms of standing out, um, I mean, obviously, yeah, um, we all want to stand out a little bit. We all want um, our work to be recognized. And, and nowadays, it's a lot harder to do that because so many people are pursuing this as a career, social media, everybody has a, a, a presence. Um, and to be honest, if you don't have a presence, it's probably not a really good thing for you. Um, if you let standing out be your focus, though, you're going to end up driving yourself insane. Uh, the focus really should be doing good work and putting it out there as often as you can, but without driving yourself into a frenzy, without really like, I know what it's like to feel hungry and to feel like I need to be chasing something and be doing something every every minute of every day, and sometimes it can pay off, but you can burn yourself out. And sometimes it doesn't pay off, and you burn yourself out. So, doing good work and always being putting content out there is really all you need to do. The work should stand for itself. I might, I might add one quick thing, which is um, you can, you have three really terrific artists who are working, sitting in front of you, and there's so many more in the industry. Um, if you Google their portfolios, right, if there's a movie or a TV show that you love, and some of you who have stopped by for portfolio reviews over the course of this event, previous events, have heard me say this. Very simple life hack is go on imdb.com, look up the movies, the TV shows, the projects that inspire you, look at the crew list, and look at who's getting the jobs that you want to be getting on the productions that you want to be working on, and Google their portfolios and see, one of the things that will be super encouraging is you'll find one portfolio, totally different portfolio, totally different portfolio. You're going to realize, oh, there isn't one box that I have to be in to be a Skydance artist or to be a Disney artist or to be a Nickelodeon artist, etc. And so that should be really encouraging. But there will be a consistency. You will find that as different and disparate as their styles are, there is a certain quality, a professionalism, an organizational, an understanding of how to organize your work and what kind of work to present, um, and that's going to be that through line. So I would say try to work that into your um, into your portfolio, and then also check out how they handle their social media accounts because that's also going to be. Yeah, I checked out before, but I feel like making it personal something that like you know it really well instead of like uh, looking at someone else's work and like copying things you don't understand it. Like when you know something, it definitely shows. So the question for those who might not have heard it is, how often do we have positions for artists who don't have any previous uh, experience? And by previous experience, you mean like you've been developing yourself as an artist, you just haven't gotten uh, paid for it yet, correct? Right? Yeah. Um, Chris, maybe as a lead, do you want to uh, yeah, speak to him as a recruiter, but I'd rather give you guys the time. You're more interested. <laughs> That's a hard one, actually. Um, there, are, there have been situations in the past where, you know, I mean, I think we've all been through it, where the well is dried up and you're like, why am I not getting any work? Or why am I not getting any attention? Or when you're first starting out, like, why am I, you know, what is it that I'm not doing that's, that's not working? Um, kind of to the point that you're saying, there's no right or wrong way, per se, what works for one artist might not work for the next. Um, I don't want to put too much emphasis on an online portfolio and social media, because Lord knows I hate social media, but it serves a purpose. It, um, it allows somebody who's in the middle of nowhere to have their work seen and be shown, and when you, you know, can cross the digital path with somebody who works for a company like Skydance, where we, you know, we send a presentation, are willing to work to people all over the globe, um, you know, this isn't how it used to be back in like the, 60s or the 80s where you had to live in Burbank or you had to live near a studio. Uh, so 
getting your stuff out there for the people to actually see. Um, and if that means becoming a little bit more social media savvy, you can do all that stuff and kind of learn to play the game, so to speak. Um, it's, it's, a, it's a good tool to have you know, at your disposal. But again, networking. Again, talk to people, ask questions, go on LinkedIn. I mean, you know, recruiters are, are out there and sometimes they may be hard to reach just because their jobs are so hectic. They've got so many um, applicants to look through. But even if all you do is just take the initiative to reach out to them and be like, hey, you know, and, and of course in a very cordial, polite kind of way, but just be like, hey, you know, I'm a young artist, I'm trying to do this, uh, do you have any insight or leads or any advice? Because even just the fact that you introduced yourself may at some point for some reason pay off later on down the road, whether it's a couple weeks or a couple months or a couple years, they may remember you. And if you have something to back it up with your work being shown on the internet, it makes it all that much easier. Yeah, I'm gonna add something to I feel like uh, when you just start create like a portfolio like you working on a project, like have like everything uh, planned, like this is actual project you're working for something, create that and like literally send them to everyone. Like go to the smaller studio as like maybe from the bigger studio, just email them and say like this is my work and I would they would definitely respond and they would respond to the list of year and they reach out to them. You have more uh, opportunities to be freelance with them. And like all those little freelance week, like one week freelance, two weeks freelance, they just like go to your portfolio and then if you reach out to like uh, bigger students, they're more interested because they know you go with other people. Skydance is my first art job that I had, and um, the, the position that I applied for was one that, like, I kind of reached a point where I was like, I'm just going to apply. I'm just going to apply for something, even if I'm like, maybe I don't have the amount of experience that they're looking for, but I'm just going to apply for it. There's no harm in applying for things if you know, like, specifically you're like a storyboard artist, just, just apply for it. It doesn't hurt. Um, and so, I think having that confidence to just go for it sometimes, even if you don't have the experience behind you, you never know, like someone can see something and it's just gonna hit some some right point and then they're just gonna talk to you, yeah. Yeah, if I could add something too, when she was talking about the smaller studios, um, I think maybe sometimes, you know, when you're young, you look at the studios like Disney and Pixar and everything like that, you're like, oh, those are the holy grail of animation and, and if I don't work for a studio like that, am I ever gonna make it? But don't write off the smaller studios because oftentimes they'll land a project that could take them from a small studio to a large studio, you know, in a couple of years. Or you may work with somebody, whether they're permanent or they're freelance as well, who you build a great relationship with, and then you find yourself in a situation where they're reaching out to you for a job on another studio, maybe a bigger one. Um, and, and sometimes smaller studios are really, really good too because there's a little bit of a, a corporate structure in a lot of the larger studios, which makes sense, but if you're younger and you're starting out and you kind of want to get your feet wet, um, sometimes a smaller studio can be a little bit easier, a little bit more relaxed, a little bit more free in terms of creativity, but there's pros and cons, of course, but um, yeah, don't, don't write them off by magic just because it's not, you know, a huge name that everybody knows. Yeah, now that everything is online, there are so many small students like from the US and the US and Europe that you can just reach out and like, I've done like so many advertisement work, like graphic design for like in New York because I was in New York but it was like all online. And just like, it's so, I think that's a big Hi, I'm Um, My question is, I think Chris touched on this a little, but um, I'm interested to see if Skydance uh, will immediately write off the applicants that are a little popular artists, um, especially if you're, you're interested in working in the California office. I mean, what if you live in the middle of nowhere? Um, would you be able to yeah. work with someone remotely? I can take this one. Yeah, it's a, it's a little bit more of a bureaucratic answer that I deal with on a daily basis. So, no, we, our first, like, as recruiters, first thing, first, middle, and last thing we look at is the portfolio, and that's the main thing that interests us. 
uh, when if you're applying for an artistic role. If you're, uh, we'll look at your resume, maybe if it's like, if we need a level of seniority because we need it to be a management role. But if you're middle of your career, if you're early in your career, if you're late in your career, all we're looking for, honestly, is do you have the, the needs of this production in your portfolio? To answer the second part of your question, um, which deals more with, um, which deals more with um, your location, we are a studio that's located in LA and in Madrid, as we laid out, and in uh, the tri-state area. If you're outside of that jurisdiction, then we can't hire you full time. Um, we can freelance you. So um, we do work with people remotely, and we do have the ability to hire. We have some entities in some other places, and when you correct me if I'm wrong, I know Texas is one, and Washington State, and then the, the entity on the East Coast, yeah, covers New York, Connecticut, and New Jersey. So we can hire full-time out of any of those states. If you're not in those locales, we can still work with you. We work with freelance contractors all the time. I won't get into all the ins and outs of it, but because um, California is more regulatory over business. There are certain parameters that hinder us in terms of how long we can work with a contractor. Typically, it's limited to six months within a 12-month period, uh, which means we can work with you the full year if we do one month on, one month off, one month on, one month off, or we can work six consecutive months, then we take six months off, and then we can work together again. But it makes it a lot easier for us if you are outside of the LA area. If you have an LLC or a company in your name, that does help us because then we get around sort of some of the regulations because it's uh, it's like it's more like a vendor relationship. And so having an LLC or S corp if you're outside of the California, out of the LA area, is helpful. Yeah, and I think to add to that, um, from a less like bureaucratic standpoint, what he's saying is true. But like for example, on our production, one of my character designers is in Seattle. Um, when we were first starting, we were technically still, you know, in lockdown, so it's a little bit of a different reason, but our production supervisor was in New York City. We had uh, a business artist who lived in Sweden. So, it, it's, you're no longer restrained to your location in terms of work. Now, when it comes to, of course, like, full-time or freelance, that's a little bit different, but, uh, you know, modern age technology has made it so much easier and we can really tap the best talent everywhere. Yeah, it's been really great. That's been one of the silver linings of COVID. Um, you got to find a silver lining where you can. There are so few when it comes to COVID, but one of the silver linings is just how much it's the culture of opening up to the whole world electronically and virtually has become a thing, and so that's been really great. I think we have time for one more question. Hi, I'm Ashley. Um, I guess my question is: Will there or is there any? programs that you're offering or apprenticeships programs that will be happening soon and what compensation for that vary based on experience. So do you want to take it in with me? I can take this one <laughs> <laughs> because we just had a big rework of our internship and training programs um, that will probably be launching next year and what those are going to be is currently we have an internship program that runs fall, spring, and summer. That's just in development. So if you're interested in writing or creating stories and working alongside creators to help develop their idea, that's what that internship is focused in. Um, but in our new program, we will be having internships in a variety of departments, um, which includes art and story and other creative uh, technology as well. Uh, if there's any tech people out there, and then we also will have a trainee program that is specialized in art and story. For compensation, the compensation typically for our internships is minimum wage, unless there's a specialty involved in that. And then for our trainee program, if everyone is familiar with the 839 Innovation Guild, we will be paying the trainee minimum for story and art, which is, I can't remember the exact, but I want to say the high number. Um, one thing, going back to the lady's question here, um, and Chris's answer, and, and all of your answers about not forgetting about smaller studios, um, the Animation Guild on their website has a list of all the union franchise studios 
from the biggest players to the smaller production houses. So if you're not sure what are those smaller studios where I might be able to start out, um, they're all listed on the Animation Guild. And also, if you're applying for jobs and you're interviewing and you're wondering, I have no idea what I should be asking as far as compensation, they have a uh, union standard uh, rate ranges also broken down. And so that should give you a barometer of what you should be asking for. Thanks for coming, everyone. Thank you all.